To me, this is sacred dirt. I know it doesn't look like much now, but this ground at 22nd and Brooklyn was once the home of some of the most exciting moments in the history of the Kansas City Chiefs. Municipal Stadium was torn down long ago, but the memories, ah, the memories live on. And the man most responsible for all the excitement, including the Chiefs' only Super Bowl championship team, is going to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, this Sunday. He's my old coach. We call him the mentor. You know him as Hank Strand. Football is a game of people. Nice going. Nice going, baby. Hey, Bobby. Bobby Stein. Hey, Bob. Nice going, boy. Hell of a job. He was the best coach. He was the best coach I ever had. I wonder if he can go blue slot 32 XGO. He did it with such dignity and class and, and personality. There was something a little bit unique about Hank Strand. I was fascinated by the way he talked, the way he was his personality. Mr. Official, let me ask you something. How can six of you miss a play like that, huh? All six of you. I quickly realized that we were working with someone that was really unique. He's been on the field. No. What? And not only in his imagination as a coach, but in his vocabulary. There's too much leakage on that play. There's too much leakage down there, I'll tell you that. As a communicator, I mean, he was funny and a motivator. He was, he was serious. What in the hell's going on out there with those blocks? What play did we blow? We can't make mistakes in this game. You know, he's a little general. He was our Napoleon. <laughs> the greatest coach in pro football, Hank Stramp! you got to have attitude. Attitude and a burning desire to be the best that you can possibly be. That's what it's all about. Football was important. And uh, it was all about the winning. It was always about the winning. He played to win. He just knew that if we played the way he had trained us, he had taught us, he had coached us, we'd win that football game. He put Kansas City on the map. We were a major city when we won the world championship. Thank you very much. We're very proud of the recognition that we established as champions of the world of professional football. And we sincerely think that you people here are the super fans of pro football. Thank you very much. The greatest day in the history of Kansas City. This team is the greatest in the universe. His father was Polish, Polish descent. They came over to Gary and established themselves there in that community. My grandfather was a tailor by trade, was also a wrestler. And it just happened that the Barman Bailey Circus came to town and offered $50 for anyone to beat the circus strongman. And my grandfather actually beat him, got the $50, and they offered him a job as the circus strongman. His real name was Henry Vilcek, W-I-L-S-Z-E-K. He wrestled under the name of Henry Stram, the wrestling tailor. My father had his name legally changed to Henry Stram because everyone knew him by Stram. Coach Stram was a, uh, a brilliant coach, a brilliant innovator, a demander, perfectionist, had a great, great vision for talent. You knew that the, his teams were always going to be prepared and he was a colorful coach and, uh, you know, he wasn't afraid to uh, make decisions, uh, he, he wasn't afraid to be reckless on the field. It's a great honor for him to go into the Hall of Fame and take his rightful place with the legendary people who made this great game.
Well, Coach, uh, you are going into the Professional Football Hall of Fame. Uh, when you first heard about it, what was your reaction? I didn't know for sure whether that was for real or what, <laughs> or someone was playing a game. <laughs> so I didn't know what to expect, but when I finally got the news, why it was, you know, it was very gra gratifying, very heartwarming, and thinking about our team and, and uh, you know, the, the great players we had, like yourself and all the other guys, I felt, felt so f lucky to be able to get into the Hall of Fame because I think that uh, uh, never would have happened without the opportunity that was provided by Lamar Hunt. It wasn't for that opportunity, probably never would have happened. <laughs>I was uh, looking for someone who had had a successful experience as a head coach and I spent a lot of the early months pursuing Bud Wilkinson who was the coach of the Oklahoma Sooners football team and he was the greatest name in coaching at that time. Uh, then I interviewed a couple of other assistant coaches. I, I interviewed a a young man named Tom Landry who had been recommended to me by a sports writer. But among the people that I talked to was an assistant coach at the University of Miami named Hank Stram. I was uh, impressed with the way he could describe what he wanted his offense to do, the things that he was trying to uh, coach a team into, uh, into a position to win football games. Watching a hole in the 24. The big rush is on, the kick is up, the kick is good, Dallas is the champion. Dallas I guess you're looking for a leader. Ultimately, uh, I settled on Hank, and he turned out to be quite a great leader. There's their coach, Hank Stram, carried off the field. You've never done anything other than coach. Right. How come? What got, what got you into coaching? Well, you're from Gary, Indiana. You're supposed to go to the steel mills or something like that. When well, you I was in Gary, Indiana, one of the great resort cities in the world, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing about it was we had a, I had a great high school coach, Chuck Bear. You, his son. Yes. I recruited him, and he came to Purdue. Remember? Yes. And uh, oh, he was he was a great fella. He says, you know, I've been trying to tell you something for some time. He said, but I'm a little reluctant to, but I think this would be a good time. I hope that you listen to what I tell you. Don't ever permit yourself to get into the coaching business. He said, make sure you get a job, insurance, whatever it is, but don't get into coaching because there's only one thing that's going to ever happen to you. If you go into coaching, one thing will happen, and that is you're going to get fired. He said, but I know you got a great passion for the game, and I know how much you love football and all those kind of things, and so I just want to warn you, don't get into coaching. So I listened. Next thing I know, I was in coaching. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you've ever done, is that right? Right. Yeah, right. He was a teacher first. He knew the techniques and fundamentals of all the positions in, in football. His coaching, unlike people today, when they have staff of 50 to 20 people on the staff, I don't think the head coach gets to coach that much. Well, Hank was so deeply involved in all phases of the game. He was truly a coach that, that knew everything about the game of football. He spent so much time with me after practice on how to hold the ball, protect the ball, my legs. It was night after night after night to dark. I don't think that I really knew who I was as a player, as a running back, uh, until the mentor, the teacher, uh, focused on what I was doing and what I needed to do. He was the mentor. He coached, you know. He wasn't one of these guys that sat back and looked and observed and let everybody, you know, he was involved. The mentor plus. The mentor was a very mild description. I'm not really sure where the mentor came about. All I remember is that all of a sudden it was just like that's what everybody was calling him. And it was so apropos because he he was 
he was the king, he was the leader, he was the, he was the instrument that made everything happen. When did the term mentor come in? We all call you mentor. When did, when did that start? You know, who, you know who started that? No. Monsignor Mackey. Really? Monsignor Mackey in Boston, right. Massachusetts. Yes. We were playing Boston, so I went to church, was walking out to go out in the street, and there Monsignor Mackey was. And he says, aren't you the coach of the Dallas Texans? I said, yes, sir. And I said, uh, uh, Monsignor, would you like to go to the game tonight? Oh, my God, yes, yeah, I sure would. I said, okay, good, you got the deal. I said, we're gonna eat at four o'clock, you be with us at four o'clock, had a pregame meal, you sit in the bench with us during the course of the game. So that's how we became involved with Monsignor Mackey. And then, once he got involved with our team and everything, the term mentor came up. How, out of a clear blue sky, he just called me the mentor. <laughs> and that stuck. And that's how it started. <laughs> Let me ask you something about Monsignor Mackey. It seems that every big game that was nationally televised, regardless of where it was, he would show up. How, how did that all come about? Well, I always invited him to come yeah, to the I games. Know. Yeah, <laughs> Why? Always. You were just looking for the edge? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, we, uh, he was such a good guy, you know. Well, I he know was that. such a, yes. And he enjoyed it so much. I thought maybe as a coach you are just looking for a little edge or something that might put us over to where we might have a better chance of winning if you had the no, good Mon Senior there? Yeah, I never, uh -huh. I, isn't it funny? I never, never thought that. Never huh? occurred to me at no, all. No, I'm sure it didn't. Uh-uh, never occurred to me. <laughs> Rhythm now, hey, amen, hey, amen. Hank was an innovator. He had a great imagination. Innovations that are used today, even though sometimes they do not go back and acknowledge him for them. Change it up, you know, move in pocket, score. Otis Taylor down the sideline. Hey, Lenny, they don't give it, call the plays, you know? So many things that are in vogue today, Hank was the first one to do it. When did the, all these innovations that you came about, when did they start with the moving pocket, uh, you know, shifting people, people in motion, all those things that you were doing before everybody else. When did that start? Well, at that time, when I, we first came into the league, the personality of the National Football League was all the same. Everybody did the same thing. You remember, Lenny? You know, everybody basically ran the ball the same way, the defense was the same way, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I, I just felt that it was gonna be very, very important for us to deviate from the norm and do something that nobody else has seen. The point would be that it was the conceptual creativeness that was always the joy, because you have a coach who's like a mad scientist who sits around doing X's and O's. The tight eye, you'd have the regular formation of the, the offensive lineman. Lenny would be right up underneath the center. I would be right a couple steps behind Lenny. Then you'd have the fullback behind me, and then you'd have the running back behind the fullback. You're all in one straight line right behind that center. And who knows which way any of you are going to be going on that particular play. When you're on defense, I mean, you're guessing. There must have been two, three hundred plays that, that we could run out of the different formations. so innovative, he took that moving pocket for Lenny, and those guys kept getting bigger and bigger, and Lenny couldn't see over them. He was able to move Lenny outside, give him some protection on the backside. These are things that Hank came up with. The 
triple stack defense, the fact that you had people aligned on one half of them instead of directly in front of them, forcing them to have to make decisions as to whether they go this way to block you or get help from someone else, and therefore we had certain advantages because of size and angles. And once you create confusion and decision, it works to you at that moment when the other person makes a mistake. I think it was the greatness of the players that he chose that made the innovations great. People have the mistaken impression, Lenny, that, that uh, coaches win games. I never felt that coaches win games. Players win games. And that's how that happened. Hank was a poker player. He's the kind of poker player that if you gave him a good hand, he'd clean the table. And that's what he had with that Chiefs team. He had a great hand. There were some great players, and Hank knew it and just ran the table with that team. I think he was a great evaluator of talent. He always had good football players. You know, Lenny Dawson is the quarterback, and then the great defenses that they had, Buck Buchanan and Willie Lanier and some of those great, great defensive football players. And Hank put it all together. He made it happen. During that period of time, when there was a grave question of opportunity, being African American, attending an African American university, and opportunities prior to the AFL coming along, did not happen to be that vast. So it was great to have a chance to see someone who appeared to be committed to winning with the best available talent, regardless of where it came from. So that was really the first image uh, that I had of Hank going back to 1967. How did you get such great talent? I mean, a lot of those draft choices, and those were the days when it was competing with the National Football League yeah. for the talent, yet uh, you came up with uh, so many outstanding players. We were very concerned about accumulating p good talent, you know, and we had Don Klosterman, who was with the San Diego Chargers, was a very astute guy. And so I got him away from San Diego and brought him with us, and then we got Lloyd C. Wells. Mm -hmm. He was one of the top scouts in the business at that particular time and uh, signed him to a contract and he became a scout for us and did a good job. He got Otis Taylor, Gloucester Richardson. Frank Pitts. Yeah, Frank Pitts. Uh, he, he was all, he, he was scouting the black schools primarily, was yes, he not? That's yes, that's right. Yeah, that's what he was doing. Yeah. And, uh, and did a very good job. And he was, he, was, he was a real character, as you know. You know he, I'd say, now, Lloyd, go to see so-and-so and then call me and let me, think, let me hear what you think. He said, okay, coach, okay. So he, he called me back. I said, what do you think? He said, coach, I took a good look at this guy, and I think he would be a very, very good parking lot <laughs> assistant. <laughs> Or he could sell programs. <laughs> <laughs> you, you always have nicknames for all these people. Now, Lloyd Wells, you called him out of sight. Out of sight. How'd that come about? Well, it, 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 it was initiated by his verbiage. Say, I'd say, Lloyd, what about so-and-so? He said, Coach, he said, man, I saw that guy. And I guarantee you, he is out of sight. <laughs> So, <laughs> anyway, he was a great asset. He really signed a lot of great players for us. Lloyd went out and got a lot of uh, black players from the black school, where nobody else is recruiting the players from Grambling, you know, uh, Pearview, you know, Morgan. And Lloyd Wells was the guys out there, you know, shaking the bushes and getting them, you know, sneaking them up here, showing the coach, coach, this guy can play. This guy can play, take him in. And Coach Stram was, uh, you know, believed in him, brought him up to training camp and, and played him, you know. And, I mean, if you think you can play, he'll bring you to camp and give you a chance. And that's the kind of guy he was. 
even over the years since I've been around pro football, since 1967, knowing how things were prior to coming here in the, quote, old NFL, it was just refreshing to see a view that even is being spoken of today in terms of issues of diversity, in issues of affirmative action before the Supreme Court, which are being discussed today, that this was done 35 years ago, here. Ten years the American Football League was in existence. You were the winningest coach in the American Football League uh, during that span of ten years. How important is that to you? Well, it's very, very important, uh, Lenny, at that time, especially when we, threw that, when we went through that stage where nobody expected us to be anything, you know. Here you got a coach that never was a coach before, you know, and you got a new league and, and the people from all over the place and everything. Nobody thought very much about the potential of the American Football League in general. But I felt very strongly about the fact that if we got good people with a great attitude, with great discipline, make every personal sacrifice necessary for us to win and uh, make sure that they understand it's a team of us, it's a team of we, it's not a team of I, it's not a team of me. And that's what our team was all about. If you look back and reflect on the, on the personality and the attitude, uh, and the intelligence. You gotta have a good schoolhouse too. You gotta have a good schoolhouse, a good schoolhouse, good mind, and a good Valentine. You got, that's gotta be a very, very important combination as far as you're gonna play f winning football and be the kind of a football team you wanna be. And that was just basically what I felt and that's what we did. Whatever he did, he had the men that believed in his vision and knew that it could be executed. And um, I think that's very important. The man had character. I believed in what he was saying. That sometimes you have a coach, you doubt what they're saying and you, and you just don't quite buy into the program. I know that I bought in to Hank's program totally and the players did and that's so important. You know, sometimes you want to be a little too feisty. And, you know, he, he sort of seemed like he, he knew how to conquer that, you know. See, the thing was the Kansas City Chiefs at heart. No matter what they say about him or what, he was the Kansas City Chiefs at heart. I just love the guy. The guy is a winner, and, and he showed us how to win. We couldn't have been put in, in better hands than, than be put in the hands of Hank Stram and then to get paid for, for working and playing for him. Super Bowl I, 1967. Bart Starr hit Max McGee with a TD toss, and Green Bay led Kansas City 7 to nothing. Len Dawson to Otis Taylor. The Chiefs storm back, first and goal. Moments later, Dawson looped a pass to Curtis McClinton in the corner of the end zone, and the game was tied. Let me ask you about the first Super Bowl game, Kansas City against the uh, Green Bay Packers in the Coliseum out there in California. What did you think our chances were before that game of beating the Green Bay Packers? Uh, you know, very frankly, Lenny, I thought, I thought we had a great chance to win the game because I thought we had a, we had a, you know, we had a good offensive team. We had Chris Burford, you know, you at quarterback. We had, you know, the battery of outstanding people and, uh, I thought we could move the football and felt we had to throw the ball against Green Bay because they played man-for-man -man coverage all the time, you know, and we thought we could take advantage of that. 
But the only thing that really bothered me was the fact that I didn't think we were ready as a football team to be the kind of a defensive team we would have to be to beat the Green Bay Packers. And you know, before halftime, we, we blew a field goal that would have, would have given us a lead at halftime, right? Well, yeah. made it closer. I think it was uh, 14 to 10 at halftime. Yeah, but, uh, 14 to 10, right. That was a bad opportunity, and then... Uh, but see, let me refresh your memory. I threw an interception. The NFL Packers were routing the AFC Chiefs as Willie Woods intercepted a Dawson pass and ran the ball all the way down to the Kansas City five-yard line. The Willie Wood, wasn't it? Willie Wood. Willie Wood came in and, you know, from the safety position, came in and intercepted the ball. That's, and that was a big turning point in the game. I don't like to remember the first Super Bowl. <laughs> it was disappointing that we lost, uh, but we gave it our best. You had to do some soul searching, but listen, this is a tough game. You don't win every game, and we were disappointed we didn't win. We played very competitively in the first half, and then we just had to go back to the drawing board. He said, I, I watch you out there on the field. He said, you know, every time you knock these guys down, they all you have you have them up. He said, let me tell you something. He had his, he had his straw in his mouth. He said, let me, play. He said, let me tell you something. He said, we pay you to knock them down. Let his teammates pick them up. So I never forgot that from that point on, I never pick up anybody. Tell me, where, you, where did you get your philosophy of coaching, your philosophy of, uh, of rules that, that, that you set forth? How did all that develop? Well, uh, do, you, do you happen to remember, uh, Lenny, the, the uh, uh, if you, you probably don't even remember this after all these years, but telling our team that when you first started as a young kid playing football, they called you a football player. Then you went to high school, they called you a football player. Then you went to college got a scholarship, you, you know, they called you a football player. But you got to understand, you have never, ever been a football player. You're a young man who played football, so football is what you did, not what you are. You got to understand that we could play football for just an extended period of time. I don't know how long we'll be able to play the, play the game itself, but we're always going to be a team, always going to be a team. And uh, that was the approach. And I think that uh, the fact that our players played like they played, with the, with the attitude, with the discipline, with you know, the, the great feeling everybody had for each other, uh, it was a wonderful relationship. And uh, uh, that's just basically what I felt was very, very important with regard to the success of a football team. He was like a father uh, type of uh, individual, and of course, uh, we were all a bunch of young guys. We were away from uh, where we were raised, and we had a couple dollars in our pockets, so you know, we tended to do a, a, several different things once in a while, and Hank would always uh, you know, sort of rein us in and try to steer us the right way. He ran a tight ship, and you knew where you stood, and if you, if you gave your 110% every day, then Hank was your best guy. But you don't goof off. Everybody's got to make a choice at life and everything else. You know, you chose to play for him. You chose to go by the rules. If you didn't want to go by the rules, hit the road. When I got here, I wasn't too disciplined. I didn't see that much discipline at one time in one week of playing. And I used to catch the ball behind my back. Just for the fun of it, just to live and practice up. And he found me $500, you know? And I said, for what? 
catch the good that do the blue blah blah so and so ball like you're supposed to catch it. Five hundred dollars. So that evening I called home and told him I was coming home. I'm tired of it. I can't take no more of it. That's that. Only thing I didn't know my mother had gotten a a basket of roses from Hank telling her how great a mom she was and what. In his talking to her, he let it be known that he was doing this for the family. So I called home and told him I'm tired, I'm coming home. And she said, you ought to act right. See, that's a shame. See, all the opportunity you're getting, you're not doing right. You should just keep your mouth closed. The mother don't like that. And I said, what are you talking about? Where are you getting this from? So I went to the office the next morning. I had told the guy out in the dressing room that I'm going to punch him out. I'm tired of it. I don't care no more. So he, he walked up to me and he said, I love you. I love you like a son. Don't tell anybody, but I'm not going to find you. Just let it go. Me and you. Phyllis, all the boys love you too. Just, uh, yeah, I'm crying. He crying. He didn't pull one on me. He, he's crying. I think I went that weekend and game and caught about four or five touchdowns. This is a family thing. We were a family. It was not a real wonderful day, weather-wise, down in New Orleans that day. Fairly cold temperature and swirling winds. Let's go, boys. Hey, let's go, man. Super Bowl IV was the Super Bowl that made the Super Bowl Super Bowl. The Vikings were a 14-point favorite, so people that say, well, Super Bowl III made parity, that's not true. There wasn't parity. There was parity after the butt-kicking that the Chiefs delivered to the Vikings. The Vikings were not only out-fought and out-thought, they were physically whipped. had a certain theatrical sense about it. How in the world can all six of you miss a play like that? In the way he spoke, in the way he dressed, in the way he coached. Hey, we, go, we don't give him anything, man. We keep scoring that pressure on, putting the coal in the fire, kicking a pie behind. Let's go, come on. He was the first coach to realize that this is not only a game, but this is entertainment. Yeah, Kosalki was running around there like it was a Chinese fire drill. He had one phrase, though. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. <laughs> matriculating down the field, gentlemen. They didn't know where Mike was. Didn't know where he was. They didn't know where to go. When we mic'd them for the Super Bowl, before the game, uh, my father and I decided that we wanted to mic Hank. Not because we thought he was going to win, but we thought Hank's personality was so unique that that's why we wanted to put a mic on him. And my dad said, Hank, we, you know, you've wore a mic for us before. We'd like you to, you know, would you wear a mic in the Super Bowl? Hank, uh, I'll never forget his, his, his reply. He said, um, yeah, he said, uh, I'll do it, but uh, uh, some coin of the realm is going to have to exchange hands. Money, 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 money is money so my. My father looked at me, and I'd never heard that expression before. My father, you know, what, what do you mean, Hank? Hank says, uh, the man who doesn't wear a mic unless a coin of the realm exchanges his hands, boys. You know, some dead presidents. The, the mentor wants something he can fold up and put in his pocket. When we never paid a coach before, so that's, well, $250. Hank says, no, Hank, Hank, Hank says, that, that wouldn't even pay for the mentor's dry cleaning bill for a week. $250 is not going to do it, boys. So we eventually got up to $1,000, and that's what, that's what we agreed on. 
And uh, it was well worth it because that film uh, became, uh, to this day, the most popular Super Bowl film that we've ever made. Blue Rice Lot, fake draw, 908-51. They wired him up for the Super Bowl. He calls the plays from the sideline, you know, they worked. I mean, it's on film, you know, it wasn't no movie. He can't, he can't cover that thing, Lenny. Throw it anytime. This franchise has only won one Super Bowl game. And uh, you were the head coach of that, that football team in January 1970 when we beat the Minnesota Vikings. What do you remember about that season and about that particular game? What stands out to you? You know, you don't, you don't win by accident. You win by design. 65 toss power trap. Look for 65 toss power trap. What does it look like? Hey, look for our 65 toss power trap. Let's see what it looks like. And they only had a week to prepare for that game. That might pop wide open, Rats. Remember, there wasn't two weeks. There was just one week. And they just couldn't handle it. You know, the defense did a good job. The interceptions. You know, Jan Sinneru kicks a 48-yard field goal. You know, you just got to believe in something. You got to see clearly and believe strongly, and then go ahead and do it. And that's what you did. I can see clearly. There are, I believe, five of your players from the Kansas City Chiefs enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You've got Bobby Bell, Willie Lanier, Buck Buchanan, Jan Stenrud, and myself. How proud does that make you feel? Well, it makes me very, very proud, but very disappointed along with it, because I think that the guys, all you guys that are in the Pro Football Hall, Hall of Fame, that's exactly where you belong. But we got a lot of other guys on that from that team that also belong in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. They added a great dimension to our football team and the, the family atmosphere. And I always said, you know, that we're gonna always be a family and we're always gonna be a team. And I think this is true. You know, you, uh, I, uh, people are always amazed, they said, well, so-and-so called you. Yeah, Lenny Dawson called you. Uh, Freddie Abanis called you. Ed Buddy called you. E.G. Holop called the other day. You know, but that's, that's what we were all about. We're a team. We're a team. We're people, you know, who really respected each other and enjoyed being with each other, and they were great winners along with it. And it wasn't for you guys who played so well, you know, I probably wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. It was very modest. Uh, he's the one that, that, that put us together. The team developed and the family developed as one, and there was a bond and a feeling of, of uh, total commitment to each other um, that is still there years after the team is no longer together. You've never seen men revere another man the way this group of people revere the mentor. The important thing is we won a Super Bowl. The important thing is we love him. And the important thing, he taught us to love one another. I'd do anything in the world for him. You know, he helped me. You know, I was young and running around, but he helped me so far as in life and how to accept life. I love the guy. He's cracking up. Since I left sport, I have not seen anything close to a team. I've heard people in every organization speak about team building. 
trying to have that thing called a team. I've not seen it come close because the concept is not words, it's people having a heart and a feeling for one another that extends beneath the core of what someone else said. So if you don't have that in essence, you can use the words, but you don't quite have the thing. Arrowhead Stadium, as I look around, I see 31 names prominently displayed out there. Those are all members of the Chiefs Hall of Fame. Of the 31 names, five of those people are in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. But as I look around, there's only one coach's name out there. The name? Hank Stram. Hank Stram coached all five members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He coached all but six of the names that are out here at Arrowhead Stadium to show you what an outstanding coach he has been. You know, let's talk about relationships. Ours is going back 50 years. When I was a senior in high school in Alliance, Ohio, I met Hank Stram, who was an assistant at Purdue University, and he was one of the guys that talked me into going to that particular university, one of the best decisions that I ever, ever made. Hank Stram has been so instrumental in a lot of players' lives, but none more so than my life. Hank Stram is the reason that my name is out there at Arrowhead Stadium. Hank Stram is the reason that I am in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Hank Stram is one of the best coaches to ever coach the game of football. I don't care what level you are talking about. Let me tell you something. He coached. He just didn't sit around there and watch other people do the work. He was involved in every aspect of the game. He should have been in the Hall of Fame a long time ago. But that not being the case, I'm happy to say that on August the 3rd, a guy that should have been there, deserves to be there, will be there. Hank Stram will be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. <laughs> My wishes are coming true right now, just knowing that uh, he's going to be inducted and he's going to be amongst the great ones. I believe he was the winningest coach in the history of the AFL. He was coach of the year three times. He went to the first two out of the first four Super Bowls. He was a winner. This year is my 20 year reunion. He presented me and I'm glad that I'm back there to watch him go in as a Hall of Famer. I don't know why Hank has been overlooked, but it's finally been corrected, and the man, the head man, the mentor is, is uh, going to be where he belongs, in the Football Hall of Fame. What would you like your legacy to be? When people think about this guy, Henry Hank Stram, out of South Bend, Indiana, what would you like to people think of him? Uh, I don't think about it that much. You know, very frankly, I. I just think that if you win like we won, then all you got to do is look at the record. And that tells you the story. That's it. That's what I feel. 